And with that, I would like to turn over our um, the session now to our keynote speaker, Dr. Paula Braveman. Uh, Dr. Paula Braveman, hold on, sorry about that. I thought I put the thing on my own. Sorry about that. Um, Dr. Paula Braveman is a professor of family community medicine and founding director of the Center for Health Equity at the University of California, San Francisco. For more than 25 years, Dr. Braveman has studied and published extensively on health equity and the social determinants of health and has worked to bring attention to these issues in the U.S. and internationally. Her research has focused on measuring, documenting, understanding, and addressing socioeconomic, racial, and ethnic disparities. I'll turn the mic over to you, Dr. Braveman. Oops. Uh, Dr. Braveman, I think your mic's off. That minor detail of whether we're muted or not. Sorry. Um, uh, thank you, Diana. And it's, it's a real pleasure to be participating in this conference. And before I get started, I, uh, I just want to applaud the very important work on health literacy that people are doing. So next slide, please. So I'm going to be talking about um, systemic racism or structural racism and health equity. I'll start off with some definitions and then how these concepts are related to each other and distinct from each other. Some examples of what, um, what systemic or structural racism is. And then finally, some remarks about how we can dismantle the systemic and structural racism to achieve greater health equity. So why spend time on, on definitions? Um, uh, the, the reason we need to spend time on definitions um, is that there are many different um, definitions that people use. And if there's a lack of clarity uh, among us about what systemic racism and health equity um, mean, uh, we could get diverted from the path that we wanna be on. We wanna be headed straight for health equity and toward dismantling uh, structural um, racism. Um, but they require pursuing health equity and trying to dismantle structural racism requires a very long um, process that it's very strategic at each point along the way that has to engage different stakeholders. And each of those stakeholders has their own agenda. So faced with that reality, if we're unclear about which way we're headed, it really increases the risk that we'll get lost along the way, despite our most um, uh, passionate uh, intentions. Next slide, please. So to define health equity, um, I'll offer a definition that the um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, has been using. Uh, health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, powerlessness, and their consequences including lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, safe environments, and quality education, housing, and health care. And we don't have time, uh, and this is not the place to get into the, the details of the rationale for each part of this definition, but it was very carefully crafted in light of um, observations of uh, where there have been gaps before um, in defining. Uh, health equity. So next slide, please. Um, so uh, if we, ap apart from what the formal definitions are, um, if you can think of the following three basic elements, um, when you think of health equity, you will be pointed in the right, absolutely in the right direction. So the first is that health equity is about social justice. Um, to work toward health equity is about work for social justice. It's about removing obstacles to health for groups who have been disenfranchised, who've been marginalized, 
and excluded. And it's also about addressing all the determinants of health, not only health care. So all determinants of health, for example, education, uh, housing. Next slide, please. This is a, a graphic that um, I really like. It was created um, uh, by someone in the Norwegian Ministry of Health and Care Surf uh, Services. And it portrays three different individuals um, running toward health or trying to run toward health as the goal. And in the top frame, someone is just bouncing right along, no obstacles on them, no hurdles, just straight for, straight for health. In the middle frame, uh, the person has had to go over a few um, sizable bumps and also has this boulder attached to her or, or his or their um, back. Um, so some, some obstacles um, to getting to health. And then in the bottom one, you have somebody who is carrying this enormous boulder on their back uh, and faces these very sizable um, hurdles um, to health. So when we are pursuing health equity, we are trying to remove and uh, reduce the obstacles that people experience to health. Next slide, please. So now to define racism, if we're gonna define structural or systemic racism, we better define racism first. Um, so according to um, Kamara Jones, uh, racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race, that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities unfairly advantages other individuals and communities and saps the whole society through the weight of the waste of human resources. Next slide, please. So here I've put both systemic racism and structural racism. And uh, people are now using these in different ways, largely interchangeably. And I think most of the time that that is absolutely fine, but they have slightly different emphases, um, in fact, that systemic racism refers to the racism that is very deeply embedded in the systems. So for example, legal systems, political systems, educational systems, criminal justice systems, healthcare systems. Whereas structural racism is the racism that is deeply embedded in the structures that are the scaffolding of the systems. And what do I mean by structures? I mean laws, policies, established practices, and beliefs. So because the systems include the structures, often just to not go on and on, I will just refer to systemic racism but, but sometimes uh, I will refer to structural racism where that seems, um, where that concept of the structures themselves seems particularly vivid. So next slide, you're not going to, um, you're not going to make a bad mistake if you use either systemic or structure, structural racism, I assure you. Next slide, please. The, um, this, this is a diagram to illustrate what structural um, racism is, structural or systemic racism is. And this was created by um, Gilbert G. and Rowe, and then adapted by Chandra Ford and her colleagues more recently. And what it shows is that above the waterline there is the overt racism. And so that's the hate crimes and the explicit one-on-one -on -one discrimination that is pretty um, is pretty easy to see, but below the waterline is the base of the iceberg, which is the really deadly part. Right, that's the part that ships end up getting shipwrecked on because they don't see it. It's under the waterline, um, uh, and 
these are the, the structures and the systems such as segregation, racial ideology, and institutional policies, as, as uh, G and Roe and, and Ford have listed them. So I, I think that the iceberg analogy is a really good one with systemic and structural racism. If you think of the part, the base of the iceberg, that's the deadly part beneath the purpose of the, beneath the surface uh, of the water. Next slide, please. So what do we mean when we say systemic racism and structural racism are embedded in systems and structures and institutions? We mean that they are that the it is the biased treatment that is embedded deeply in laws, in policies, and in very entrenched practices and beliefs that are so entrenched that we may not, like with the as with the base of the iceberg, we may not see them clearly for what they are um, at all. Next slide, please. So what are some examples of systemic or structural racism? I think a very important example is voter suppression and gerrymandering. Um, because these are, um, these are uh, initiatives that disempower, disenfranchise people of color um, by making their votes count less than the votes of white people. Um, and what this means is that then in the policy making, when you have voter suppression and you have gerrymandering uh, that is um, designed to give people of color less representation, then they have the people of color have less representation in policy making bodies, uh, and uh, so that the when uh, when the laws get made, the policies get made, the resource. The resources get allocated. Um, people of color are not uh, fully represented. So it is, I'd say, one of the most fundamental forms of of systemic and and structural racism. Another example is racial residential segregation. And what are some um, examples there? Well, after the um, after the Civil War. Uh, when enslaved people were um, supposedly emancipated, in the southern, in many of the southern states, laws were passed referred to as Jim Crow laws that were explicitly designed to keep uh, African Americans uh, in a um, in a second uh, second tier status and to deprive them of many many rights. Those Jim Crow laws included uh, laws that made it um, illegal for whites and blacks to live in close proximity to each other. That set the stage then for racial residential segregation. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more um, about that in a, in a second. Um, restrictive covenants are uh, another example, these restrictive covenants are these um, agreements that people have been asked to sign uh, in order to buy a house uh, that um, that they agreed that they would not, that when or if, if and when they were to sell their house, they would not sell the house to a person of color. And often it was also not sell their house to a, a Jew. Uh, and between the, the uh, legacy of the Jim Crow laws and the restrictive covenants, uh, race, racial residential segregation was assured in perpetuity so that even when you have had the passage of civil rights laws, big civil rights laws in the middle of the, the 1960s, the, the, uh, the patterns were already there, and they were so uh, so well defined um, that you had a still the um, perpetuation of racial residential segregation. 
um, and and that is so that is a, another great example of uh, systemic uh, uh, systemic racism uh, or well and um, structural racism. And what um, what about the the health consequences of racial segregation? Well, a lot of a, a lot of research has been done on that, and we know that racially segregated neighborhoods are almost always less healthy places to live, um, where you have concentrations of, of poverty, because they are places segregated areas are places of limited economic opportunity. Uh, and uh, you have um, you have uh, uh, a concentration of um, unhealthy foods, uh, places to get unhealthy foods, and an absence of sources of healthy foods. You don't have safe places to exercise, and one could go on and on and on with the health risks that are associated with racial uh, segregation. Another example of systemic or structural racism are lending practices um, that are discriminatory. Lending practices in both the private and the public lending uh, uh, sectors. So uh, let me give you an example. Uh, in the wake of the um, Second World War, a very important policy was passed um, called the GI Bill. And this guaranteed veterans uh, very, very low cost loans to, um, to buy homes. And my family, my own family was um, uh, very poor and we had lived in, we had lived in a slum and then we became upwardly mobile and lived in a trailer. Um, but then my parents were able to buy a house on the GI Bill and we entered the middle class uh, and did better and better from there. And that was the story of so many white families. But the GI Bill was rarely given to people of color. Um, other examples have to do with banks lending that uh, you've probably heard the phrase redlining, and it refers to a practice of of banks to draw on a map, draw a red line around an area where it was considered too risky to give a loan for a home or for a business. And they were explicit about how to define those zones and the criteria included uh, that they were um, inhabited by, uh, that those zones, the red line zones were inhabited by African Americans. Um, so, uh, when you have the uh, you have this discrimination in lending in lending practices that has made it much harder for uh, African Americans and other um, people of color to uh, to buy homes or to um, have businesses uh, to expand businesses as well. So, what are some of the consequences of that? Well, if you have lower rates of home ownership in an area, then you don't have the um, property tax base that is important um, to give resources to schools. In some other countries, schools are funded by universal taxation, national taxation, and then each school gets funded based on how many kids they serve. In our country, uh, a large part of the funding for schools is determined by the local property tax base. So what does this mean with these with the low home ownership uh, of um, people of color, then you, know, you don't have much of a property tax base and therefore your schools are under resourced. And I'll talk a little bit more in, in a couple of minutes ab about um, inequities in, in education because that's a, a special interest of yours being interested in, in health literacy. Um, I don't think I need to say much about um, examples of widespread and entrenched racial discrimination in employment and the, um, the uh, systemic uh, and structural racism in this regard would be where it is just sort of unwritten 
uh, you know, there's, there's nobody has written down the policy not to hire or promote people of color, um, but there are practices that have always favored the uh, uh, applicants who come from the, the most prestigious schools to which many people of color uh, did not have um, access, um, or prejudices against people with um, certain names that sound sound ethnic associated, um, or with people whose speech uh, is uh, associated with a particular um, ethnicity. And so those, those practices, those unwritten practices, even though they're not written policies or, or laws, would also be termed systemic or structural racism. Next slide, please. Environmental injustice is a really striking example of structural and systemic racism, where if you looked on a map of where environmental hazards are located, um, the waste from uh, the waste from different um, production uh, production sites, you would find that they were uh, rarely rarely located in areas where white people live. If they are located in areas where white people live, it's very very poor white people. Mostly, they've been the toxic wastes have been located in communities of color, in or, um, really near communities of color. So a direct health hazard there. The criminal justice um, system, uh, unfortunately, also illustrates um, systemic racism. Uh, I don't think I need to um, explain to people that there are very profound um, inequities in um, in policing and in sentencing, um, and this is for the same for the same offenses. And the research um, has repeatedly shown that people of color uh, are more likely to be uh, apprehended by the police, and then much more likely to be sentenced, and more likely to be sentenced um, uh, uh, to to receive a heavy a heavy sentence than uh, white people committing the same, the same offenses. Uh, and these inequities in policing and sentencing have resulted in mass incarceration. And what has that done? Well, it's ruined the lives of the individuals who are incarcerated, of course, because once you've been incarcerated, even if you're free, that stigma is there really for the rest of your life. And it is very hard to find um, to find employment. But it's not just the ex-prisoners that, that are affected by this. It's the, uh, the prisoners and ex-prisoners. -ex um, it's also the families of them. And uh, ultimately, because the mass incarceration has been so massive, it's, it's, it affects whole communities economically because you have um, people who would have been uh, wage earners who are taken out of out of life um, and and incarcerated, and then also, as I was saying, even when they um, when they emerge from from prison, they're still their chances of being economically uh, successful are very low, uh, and this affects, of course, the the economic health. Uh, and therefore the health of entire entire communities. Uh, other examples, um, um, briefly, other shameful examples, um, uh, the uh, infamous um, boarding schools for American Indian children um, who were just taken from their families, and this was throughout the 19th century and into the... Um, 20th uh, century, pretty far into the 20th century, taken out of their families against their consents and put in these uh, very harsh conditions um, in boarding schools. Uh, and the purpose was to uh, uh, 
uh, to sort of break the, the cultural identification of the kids um, with their, you know, with their Indian um, heritage. Uh, there have been um, big questions raised about um, a tremendous amount of physical abuse um, at the boarding schools. And uh, even now it's under investigations, um, a lot of graves uh, in which children are, are buried, school age children are buried near uh, some of the the boarding schools, and uh, it's still being in investigated what that what that was um, was due to, uh, and then the the example of the internment in concentration camps, basically of Japanese Americans during World War um, during World War Two. Um, so uh, the uh, many of the health care inequities. Um, uh, inequities in access and quality, I would say, also qualify as systemic or structural um, racism. The, the the difference is this, and this could be true for almost any of the the examples that that I was just giving you. That if uh, there's an instance in which there's um, one person. Uh, commits an act of racism against another person, we're, we don't call that systemic or um, or structural racism. But when many, many, many individuals repeatedly um, commit um, acts of uh, acts of racism um, or commit acts that result in acts of racism. Um, uh, and or when um, policies are passed or um, practices are codified, um, so they get um, perpetuated, um, that determine that on a on a large and a pervasive scale, uh, these will continue to occur. That's that's structural racism and systemic racism. So next slide, please. So I think um, uh, I think I've mostly talked about uh, about this. Just um, uh, perhaps we'll just underscore a, a, a few points that, that there has been a very long and a continued history of uh, dramatic segregation in education. And um, that it has been education has been separate and un, unequal, you know, not separate and equal. Um, as many proponents of of uh, segregated education have tried to maintain, they say, "Oh yes, it's separate, but but it, but it's equal, but it's not it's not equal," and that's well uh, well demonstrated. So I've, I've talked about how the, the long history of discrimination in bank lending means that people of color are less likely to own their homes, um, or if they do own their homes, their homes may have lesser value, and that then, because schools are heavily funded by local property taxes, which come from the taxes on people's homes, that the uh, people's homes and, and businesses, that schools serving communities of color are severely um, under-resourced. And, and I've mentioned voter suppression and gerrymandering, which mean then that um, people of color are uh, not represented um, equally uh, in the places where poly laws get made, policies get made, resources get allocated. Next, next slide, please. Now, I'm not expecting you to read this whole slide, uh, and I'm certainly not going to read it to you, but I put it up here um, to illustrate a, a couple of points. This is a slide that was created to make the point that education affects health um, uh, greatly, strongly, uh, and in many complex ways. Um, so, and uh, what we did here was divide the sort of the, the kinds of pathways from that lead from educational attainment to health. 
divided them into three major types. And there are there are others, and they could be grouped in in other ways as well. Um, uh, but this is how we did it here. And so the first um, example is where educational attainment affects health by shaping health knowledge and literacy, coping and problem solving, which then shape diet and exercise and smoking and how people manage their health and disease. So it's very clear that where health literacy fits here, it fits in that top box, um, right? Through the how educational attainment um, affects health knowledge, literacy, coping and problem solving. But let's look at the other two major boxes. So it, educational attainment also profoundly shapes health by affecting the kind of work that people can get. And the most powerful way that that affects health is by determining the income that we can earn. And the income that we can earn then affects the kind of housing we can live in, the neighborhood we can choose to live in, our diet and exercise options, and the stress that we have from trying to meet the everyday challenges with or without resources. And then finally, the final pathway is how education can affect health through more sort of um, psychological pathways, like our beliefs about control and self-efficacy, uh, our feeling of where we stand in society um, and the social networks that we have um, access to. So it is very clear from the literature that education um, affects, that the effects of education on health are not just through that top box, the health knowledge and literacy and coping, um, that they also are very, very strongly and dramatically through work and through work income and also the, um, the, uh, the more um, psychological aspects. So next slide, please. So health, and I showed you that to make a point, that health equity requires, it definitely requires health literacy, but it also requires literacy. And that being illiterate in the 21st century is basically a death sentence. It, it means powerlessness. It means lack of access to the advantages of education. For example, employment, income, social standing, advantageous social connections. It marginalizes people from mainstream society. So health literacy um, can avoid some health care or uh, health uh, health self self health management disasters, but it does not necessarily confer the advantages of literacy and general educational attainment with respect to access to jobs and income and social standing and social connections. Next slide, please. So, what's the the connection between health equity and systemic um, racism? that systemic and structural racism are very formidable obstacles to health. And it is easier to mitigate the harmful effects of structural racism while leaving the unfair systems and structures in place. We need actions that will have enduring effects on many people. And we need to build awareness um, because that may help make the public supportive of anti-racist policies, but it generally does not address systems or structures. We need to keep that in mind. We need to eliminate structures that have the effect of discriminating, regardless of what their intent is. And that's the point with a lot of systemic racism and structural racism. The intent to discriminate is not necessarily there now. It was responsible uh, for uh, a situation being put in place 100 years ago or 50 years ago. It may, the intent may not be there now, but the effect is still there. And so that structure needs to be dismantled. And of course, any researcher has to conclude with, we need more research, right? 
Uh, so uh, we need we need to continue studies of systemic racism, the harms it causes, and the approaches to dismantling it. Okay, and last slide, please. Okay, I want to say that we need to keep the, our eyes on the ball of the the laws and the policies and the entrenched practices that laws and policies created the racial inequities. That there's there's no question that's been substantiated many times. So, and the only way that laws and policies are going to get changed um, is to uh, is to take them on um, head head first. Uh, that laws and policies have to eliminate the racial inequities that were created by laws and policies. So we need to keep our eyes on on that ball. And sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the moment and what's sort of seems the, the low hanging fruit. Um, but uh, I would just appeal to you to always ask yourself, so what what is it that's generating this? You know, what are the structures and the systems generating this? Can I have an impact? Can we uh, have an impact on those structures and and systems? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Raven. <clears throat> um, and if I could, um, I'm just going to say, uh, okay, there I am. Um, I, I just want to say thank you, and we're going to do questions and answers with you at the end. So if you can come back with all the panelists at the end to answer some questions that might come in for you. Um, I know we have a couple already. Um, I would also now like to switch gears to our panel. Um, we have um, the collective in, uh, have the pan so Dr. Braveman did a beautiful job of, of laying the groundwork for what systemic racism is, where we've seen it in the past. And so our panel moving forward is talking about different populations and um, where they see policy issues now and how we can move the, the needle moving forward. And so I'd like to introduce our moderator for this panel, <clears throat> Alexis Guild. She is the, She's the Vice President of Strategy and Programs at Farm Workers Justice, a national farm worker advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. Switch slides. Um, she's been at um, FJ since 2011 and currently lives in Oakland. In her role, she coordinates FJ's policy, advocacy, and programmatic work. She works with advocacy organizations, community health centers, farm worker community based organizations, and legal services organizations to improve living and working conditions of farmers, workers, and their families across the U.S. Alexis has extensive experience in public health and community organizing. Prior to graduate school, she served as a health, health, served as a health education volunteer with the U.S. Peace Corps in Guatemala. She has a B.A. from Wesley College and a master's degree in public policy from the University of Michigan. I'd like to welcome Alexis to the stage, and uh, the mic is all yours. Thank you so much, Diana, and I'm thrilled to be here moderating this panel. Um, so let's just jump right in, and I'm going to introduce our first panelist. So Dr. Nikitra L. Burs is the owner-CEO of Six Dimensions, a certified woman-owned, minority-owned public health research development and practice company. Dr. Burs has been a servant in the field of public health for over 12 years. She is executive producer of a short documentary, Laboring with Hope, and this film highlights the issues of maternal morbidity and mortality among Black women. Thank you so much, Dr. Burris, for joining us today. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us. And I would like to say, just before I get started, that um, Dr. Braveman, the, the information that you heard from her presentation what, what I will talk about today is basically how we are responding to those things. We do understand that um, racism is a big, big giant to tackle. And um, we do understand that it cannot be um, just the system cannot be blown up right now. And those of us on the community level, though we are responding and we are reacting, we cannot cure it. 
And so we are doing what we can within the systems that we're operating in now. And so I'll talk about addressing maternal health crisis through community-based strategies. And um, I'm using my public health lens as a public health practitioner, as well as my community perspective as a Black woman and a Black woman who has experienced um, maternal mortality in my family, infant mortality, and maternal morbidity. And so just as I go through this presentation, you will see pictures like the one you see here, which may be a little bit fuzzy, but um, these are the memories that we have left from some of my family members. And I think it's important that we put faces to um, these numbers so that we can better understand the true impact of really this bigger system of health inequities and structural racism. Oh, next slide, please. And so we already talked a little bit about who our company is, but we are a Mississippi-based public health research development and practice company. All of our work is focused on improving maternal health outcomes, and we do our work through a health equity and social justice lens. Next slide. And I think as I set the tone for the work that we do, it's important that I do not only recognize our team for the contributions that they give um, to this work, but also just how we are trying to um, create our own system within the work that we do. And so everyone that you see here, of course, is a woman, um, but also, or identifies as a woman, I should say, but also we really work to try to develop the skills of early career professionals in this field. Um, to be able to address these inequities. And so many of the people that you see here, such as um, Jasmine Martin, she began as an intern, but she just graduated last week and she's coming on with us full time to work on health equity. Um, also Tierney, she started out as an intern, but now she works on our um, health literacy and health communications. And so we're dedicating really staff to be able to address this while we're also building the skills of early career professionals. And I think that's always um, important to note. And our staff, they use their personal experiences as well as their um, academic experiences to really do this work. Next slide. And so just briefly, I'd like to talk a little bit about Mississippi's data. And so we, of course, well, the United States has the worst rates of maternal death. Mississippi just completed our second maternal mortality report, and that covered the dates of 2017 to 2019. And during that time, there was a total of 93 maternal deaths. And so when we look at those numbers for Black women, uh, our last report, which covered 2013 to 2016, covered um, the rate of maternal death for Black women was 51.9. As you can see here, that rate has significantly increased um, since our last report to 65.1 deaths per 100,000 live births for Black women. And so then when we look at the Black to white ratio for white women in Mississippi, the rate now is 16.2, but in our previous report, it was 18.6. So the rates among white women are decreasing. And I would say two points is really significant, but the rate of increase is significant as well. And so that just shows that there is um, an imbalance in this system and much of what we see in maternal deaths is specifically around those determinants and those systems and structures where we live, um, the neighborhoods that we live in. Uh, for example, like Dr. Braven said, if, if I live in a neighborhood that I had a professor that said, well, the sirens are going off every night. I don't feel safe. I can't walk because there are stray dogs in the neighborhood. If I don't have access to healthy foods, all of those impact my health decisions, the decisions that I make to be healthy. But then when I don't have access to health care, which is what we experience in Mississippi at very high rates, we um, are one of the 12 states that has not expanded Medicaid. And during this legislative session, we just extended postpartum care to a year. And so those are things that everyone should have a right to. But the reality is that we don't. And 
the reason that we don't is systemic and it is racism. If you just our the culture here around uh, health care access, it is the tension is so thick you could literally cut it with a knife. And I know that's a very cliche phrase, but um, when our, during our legislative session, the words that are portrayed during this time, how people use language to speak to their base, it significantly impacts the health outcomes of Black women and all women in Mississippi. And so just finally on this data point, I would like to say that 87.5% of the pregnancy-related deaths in Mississippi were preventable. Um, and that was deemed by our Maternal Mortality Review Committee. And so that shows us that there's something that can be done. Next slide, please. So the way that we're doing this work, we follow the evidence. So not only do we, of course, pull from peer reviewed articles of research that has already happened, but we also do a lot of research ourselves through qualitative um, research, such as focus groups, interviews, and collaboration is really the only way that we get our work done. And then we make it a point to amplify and honor those black voices and stories uh, through this work so that we can really attach faces to the numbers. And one of our big goals is trying to shift the power dynamics. So we can talk about the big systems and structures of racism, but then those trickle down to those really personal events and activities where um, that power dynamic is so strong that if I go into a provider's office, I don't feel like I have, I'm empowered or have the autonomy to even speak up on behalf of my health. And so that's very critical in the work that we do. And just interjecting here with a, a woman that we worked with, well, a group, we had a group of mothers that we worked with and we were trying to prepare them for labor and delivery how to advocate for yourself. And after many delivered, we were checking back in. And one young lady said, as much information, as much education as you all gave us um, to prepare for this moment, when I went in, it was still challenging for me to fight against having a C-section. And we know C-section rates are extremely high, and especially when they are not medically necessary. And so she just did, that power dynamic was so strong, that system dynamic was so strong that she still felt like even after we'd had providers, doulas, all the people providing that conversation, she could not overcome that. And so that's what many Black women face in the system. And so we listen a lot as well. Next slide, please. And so how do we create sustainable change? As Shirley Chisholm says, you don't make change by sitting on the sidelines, whimpering and complaining. You create change by implementing ideas. We, we know what the numbers are. We know what the problem is. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing here in our community and with our clients who also happen to be just across the country. Next slide. So at the systems level, we are doing research and evaluation, training and development and advocacy. And I'll just briefly mention each of these. Next slide. So as I talked about research and evaluation, much of the work or pretty much all of our research work focuses on qualitative research. So that's us conducting focus groups and interviews and what happened as we got into COVID, that's when we really started doing this work, 2020. Our goal was to get out, do focus groups with moms, but you all know we are we were virtual. And so we started doing virtual focus groups. And the way we structured them is that we brought on a mental health provider because we knew that the conversations were heavy. And at times we have mental health provider facilitate the discussion. So someone who's trained to do both. And then we brought on a digital graphic recorder. And so the these are just two examples of some of the conversations that we have recorded. And so the one in purple is a focus group that we conducted with mothers and just kind of, we talked about their birth experiences, um, what they knew about doulas and breastfeeding. 
And then the one that you see on the left is an outcome of several focus groups. So we had several focus groups that had all of these individual um, digital graphic recordings. But then what we did was drill down and said, well, what are some of the big picture things that we know we can focus on and put them into a graphic? And so we do these for our company, but we also do them for other clients as well. So the one that you see on the left is for one of our clients here in Mississippi. But we also serve as an external evaluator for um, organizations who have maternal health focused projects. So we help them to shape their evaluation um, to make sure that they're reaching their goals. Next slide. And then training. So we heard through a lot of our conversations that doulas, they work in the community. They do this hard work, but they also have full time jobs. And the amount of money that they pay, were being paid as doulas did not um, provide a living wage. And so they're doing a lot of work. They're doing a lot of heavy mental work and exhausting themselves before they can't even you know, they don't even have anything to give to their families at the end of the day. So we did a workshop for um, around business development to support birth workers so that they can do this full time and just be able to kind of serve families as they would like to. But one of our bigger pieces is our health and racial equity and maternal care pilot course. We are funded by W.K. Kellogg. And over the past two years, we've developed a four unit, 16 module online course that we are piloting it in two universities here right now. Uh, for the next two years, and we we hope to have it recognized as an evidence evidence based um, curriculum at some point. But this course really focuses on the historical aspect, the systemic racism, and practical strategies that you can see in community. And so we're really giving it a community lens. Next slide, please. And then for healthcare access and advocacy, we um, this year, well, for the past several years, we've worked on Medicaid expansion. But as we worked on Medicaid expansion, we have been in coalition with other stakeholders in the community. And so each year we, we initiated a ballot initiative process and that we had to end that campaign. But our coalition has just kind of grown and grown over the years. And we have we meet weekly to try to advocate for Medicaid expansion. And so this year, um, the campaign that you see is Back to the Bond, Strong Babies, Healthy Mom Moms. And that was our, our Senate bill, 2212 is what we were trying to get pushed through to extend postpartum care. Thankfully, we got that passed. But I say that to say that community was out and in the forefront getting this done and working with our local um, lawmakers to make sure that we could move the needle forward. And it has taken two years just for us to get postpartum extension. Next slide, please. And then at the community level, we are just focusing on supporting mothers and um, narrative change through storytelling. And I'll talk just about those briefly. Next slide. So we have a partnership with Magnolia Medical Foundation. And through our partnership, we created this mother and birth worker community. And so what mothers get is they get access to a doula. And so they partner, we kind of had a speed dating event so they could match up with doulas that they felt worked for them because we looked at the evidence which said that doulas can significantly increase or improve maternal health outcomes. We also provided mental health, and that also came from our focus group discussions where families said that they need mental health. health. And so they get individual therapy as well as group therapy. And then they get a lot of education and resources. So they get um, a stipend. We got them car seats, food boxes, so many things. But the good thing that has come out of this is that at Magnolia Medical Foundation, there's now a diaper bank and a feminine product bank. And so um, families can come in and get access to diapers because we know that will alleviate a financial and economic burden. And the mothers can also get access to feminine products, which are also expensive. Um, and not just during that postpartum period, this is as long as they need it. Next slide, please. And so through our storytelling, we produced a documentary that focuses on uh, maternal mortality. 
And um, through that project, we had an opportunity to, to be featured on Disrupt and Dismantle with Soledad O'Brien. And then we've produced um, several small videos around what doulas are, just to kind of get the education out around doulas, the importance of breastfeeding, and then the importance of businesses being breastfeeding friendly. And so we tried to kind of do a big range of storytelling, like increasing education, but also giving opportunities for families to really increase their um, opportunities to breastfeed as well. Next slide, please. And I think I'm finishing up. And we can't do this without partnership. And here's a list of some of our primary partners. And we always just try to make a special effort to be able to recognize our partners and how this work gets done. Next slide. And I always say that we don't have everything that we need, but if we all just do our part in this bigger fight, um, everyone does their part then we can definitely continue to make change. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Burst, for that wonderful presentation. Our next panelist is Gladys Carrillo. Gladys is the Director of Program Services at the National Center for Farm Worker Health. She provides oversight to program services, including training and technical assistance support, chronic care prevention and program services, and health education product development and dissemination. Her experience includes direct patient care as a therapist and licensed clinical social worker, clinical service coordination, community education, outreach program development and management. She graduated summa cum laude with a liberal arts degree from St. Edwards University and holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Texas at Austin. Prior to joining the National Center for Farm Worker Health, she provided direct therapeutic services to at-risk children and underserved families and conducted clinical consultation to providers in the nonprofit and private sectors. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alexis. And so I appreciate the invitation to be talking about another vulnerable population, um, farm workers. So for those who may not be familiar with the National Center for Farm Worker Health, we are a private nonprofit organization located outside of uh, Austin and Buda, Texas. And our mission is to improve the health of farm worker families. And we do this through a number of ways in providing programs, trainings, technical assistance, and different resources that I'll go on here and, and describe a little further in future slides. But we have over 47 years of providing services and are very proud of collaborating with the 174 migrant and community health centers in our network. They are really the stars that provide direct primary care services to farm worker families. Next slide. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the history of agriculture. Since our nation's creation, agriculture has been and remains the world's largest industry and is an essential sector of the United States economy. Farmers used to rely on family locally hired hands, slave labor, and neighbors to meet the labor demands of each harvest season. And as the crop production grew over the years, Agricultural workers became a critical component in filling the labor demands and became a necessary uh, a necessity for our nation's economy. Even uh, recently in the pandemic, they became categorized as essential workers, as some of you uh, might remember. But throughout history, this population has faced adverse events of systemic racism, discrimination, and has had unfair access to adequate health care education, and other services. So who is the agricultural worker population and how have they been directly affected by these inequities within our healthcare system? Next slide. This slide gives you a snapshot of who farm workers are today. And this is based on the latest National Agricultural Worker Survey data um, as you can see, most farm workers are predominantly Latino or Hispanic, but there is great diversity within this population full of many cultures and ethnicities. So 
Um, I don't want to generalize by saying that most of them come from Mexico because we have seen a number of farm workers that are from Central America, like Guatemala, El Salvador, and other um, Latin American countries, not just Mexico. So um, keep that in mind as you uh, consider this population when we uh, discuss farm workers here in these slides. Most also identify as a male and about 50% uh, are married and have children. Now, the average age is 41 years old and um, most of them report having an income about 30,000 a year, which is below the federal poverty level. And the, the next bullets are really the bullets that I wanna to touch on the most because they, they talk a little bit about how racism directly affects this population and how literacy really impacts health outcomes as a result uh, of the limitations this farm worker experiences. So on average, the education level for farm workers is in a ninth grade. Um, but most actually have um, less than that in terms of the education that they can obtain. Um, Spanish is their primary language, but we've seen actually an increase in the um, indigenous language is uh, utilized or you know seen in farm workers more recently. And we've also seen an increase in um, Haitian Creole uh, within uh, other populations that are farm workers as well. So Spanish is just one of the many languages that this uh, population has. And um, this is something that is uh, needed as they, uh, the language uh, multiplies. And, and as we see more farm workers from diverse backgrounds, we have a, a need for more uh, language access services. The last data point shows you um, how often farm workers have actually utilized healthcare services. And in the last two years, about 71% have accessed healthcare in the United States. So as you can see, this data shows you already some of the challenges and barriers faced by this population. The next slide actually gives you a more detailed list of other challenges and barriers that this population experiences. Next slide. As you can see, there's a challenges that come just with the nature of the work. Um, there's a migratory lifestyle for migratory workers that often travel. And so if they're continuously following the crops or moving from location to location, that affects their ability to access a patient medical home um, or even to be able to uh, acquire community resources if they're often moving around. Uh, I already mentioned income, language, um, as some barriers, but transportation can also be a factor, as well as housing, uh, food insecurity, um, racism, discrimination, and the threat of deportation and immigration status. Um, we actually just now saw, I don't know if many of you have heard the news um, in Florida's legislature in the passing of SB 1718, which actually now requires hospitals in Florida to ask people their citizenship status. And they have to submit this information to the state. Um, there's also a need for employers to use E-Verify um, as a result of this bill. And there's been penalties that uh, will be enforced if they are uh, hiring any undocumented people. And so, as you can see, even within our laws, there's many um, policies that really affect agricultural worker access to different uh, areas and services, not just healthcare. But literacy levels are also a part of that, right? Literacy levels and digital literacy. Uh, with the recent pandemic, we saw an increase in the use of telehealth and teleeducation. Um, but not everyone has access to different devices, to internet, especially in rural communities, and or, um, you know, understands how to navigate these uh, systems and this technology. So there's been a huge need for that. Lack of insurance, um, having unfamiliarity with uh, the healthcare system or even just resources and benefits available to them, as well as limited labor policies and protection. Next slide. So to address these numerous social drivers of health, this timeline shows the legislative action that has taken place in order to increase access to quality health care for farm workers. Now, the Migrant Health Act 
1962 was one of the pivotal policies that many health centers across the country um, uh, now still benefit from today as it helped them receive federal funding to specifically serve agricultural workers and their families. Now, I won't go into all of these laws, but as you can see, it's been a process over the years to really advance um, protections for farm worker families and um, advocacy in these areas is still needed. Next slide. So despite these efforts, there's still laws that exclude farm workers from certain protections. Um, as you can see here, the Fair Labor Standards Act is one example, um, as it doesn't include farm workers in terms of child labor laws and overtime protections. Uh, farm workers are also excluded in many states due to minimum wage um, or do not, are not eligible for workers' comp coverage. Um, so considering these ongoing struggles, NCFH really uh, focuses on our efforts to improving healthcare access by the services that we provide. Next slide. One of the main uh, pivotal parts of our efforts is the Agricultural Worker Access Campaign. This campaign was launched in 2015 as a joint effort between NCFH and the National Association of Community Health Centers. We believe that more can be done to increase access to quality health care and to advocate for justice, equity, and inclusion for farm workers and their families. So much like the time in the movement when Cesar Chavez and other farm workers fought for human rights in the 1960s, we're continuing that uh, fight uh, to be able to advocate for um, equitable access for farm workers um, through the campaign and raising awareness about this population, but also in uh, partnering with other agencies to be able to mitigate uh, social drivers of health. Next slide. One way to mitigate healthcare barriers is through migrant health centers. As I mentioned earlier, these health centers receive specific funding to serve agricultural workers and really provide primary care services, preventative services, emergency care, pharmacy, and ancillary services. Next slide. Health centers also provide outreach and enabling services. And this is pivotal because as I mentioned, as migratory workers often travel, outreach is a critical component to be able to share information and to educate farm workers in healthcare services that are available in their communities. Next slide. So to connect with um, farm workers, here are some best practices that we wanted to uh, share on ways to outreach with them and, and to provide information. And the best way we know how is to get to know them, um, establish rapport and build trust within the community. And a lot of health centers do this through promotoras de salud or community health workers and really practice cultural humility by learning about the population, their cultural practices, their views and perceptions on healthcare and how they view or how they utilize homeopathic remedies. So it's one pivotal approach to be able to really uh, reach this population and to engage them in the healthcare system. Next slide. As well as collaborating with, um, aside from collaborating with community health workers, we also encourage you to collaborate with other uh, farm worker organizations and even to meet farm workers where they are, you know, bring services to them, utilize media channels to share information through radio, uh, different social media platforms like Facebook, Facebook, um, WhatsApp, and other means so that you can really uh, reach the population through whatever way possible. Next slide. So here's a couple strategies in terms of ways to push the movement forward that I like to cover. Um, and really encouraging you people to sign up for the Ag Worker Access Campaign, um, develop collaborations with community organizations and raise awareness about this population. One other thing I really like to uh, talk about is our Call for Help program. In the next slide, do you wanna move forward to that, Diana? It talks about the Call for Help program. This helpline for farm workers allows them to connect with the nearest healthcare center and also provides information about different social services and community referrals. 
Um, our Call for Help program also offers uh, some limited financial assistance and interpretation services. So we encourage you to share this information with your populations who might need help and support in these areas. Next slide. So here's just a, a few of the resources that we have available that I do encourage you to go to our website and download. Um, these resources are available on different health topics, um, including COVID, um, and they have different means. So we have videos, we have public service announcement, announcements, we have downloadable hard copy items. So all of these resources are available for you. Next slide, we also like to cover um, information about um, our NCFH data that we have available. Similar to the colleague that presented before, we do provide, um, we do conduct research and gather data through different farm worker surveys. And so we have that information available on our website as well as webinars and other training opportunities. And I'll wrap up uh, today's presentation by sharing that we are part of a collective. Um, NCFH is part of a farm worker health network, um, and each of us has different areas that we um, can support organizations in. So I encourage you to reach out to any of us if you're lo looking to serve this population and just connect with us so that we can help you reach farm workers in order to increase access to healthcare. Next slide. Here's our different communication channels and I'll wrap up by encouraging you to connect with us on these platforms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gladys. And our final panelist this morning is Diana Rodriguez. Diana helped set the vision for everyone on's programming and organization wide strategy and provides guidance to the frontline team that leads and supports digital inclusion programming in cities across the country. Diana has dedicated 20 plus years to working in the nonprofit sector, sector and especially enjoys engaging in work related to community organizing, nonprofit management, education technology, and business development. She is community oriented with an MBA focused in leadership and management from Loyola Marymount University. Thank you, Diana, for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, Diana Rodriguez, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm coming to you today from Los Angeles, California, though I am uh, based in Portland, Oregon now. Um, and so, uh, again, thanks so much for having me. I've, I've learned so much from everyone's presentations today, and I, I love that I'm coming in last because I feel that the uh, work that I do in digital inclusion really touches uh, every issue and every population that was discussed. Um, so let's just jump right on in. Next slide, please. So um, the mission of Everyone On is to help unlock uh, social and e economic opportunity by connecting families and underserved communities to affordable internet service and devices and providing digital skills training. Next slide. Um, in terms of our impact, we have um, touched over a million people and connected them to the internet um, since our inception 10 years ago. Um, we have distributed over 6,000 devices and we have been able to train over 2,500 uh, individuals uh, and, and prepared them with new digital skills that they can now you know, go on and take and apply in their lives. Um, so we're really proud of the work that we've done over the past 10 years uh, to help close the digital divide. Um, so the next slide here talks a little bit about the uh, methods and strategies that we employ to do that work. Um, and so so the first of these, and uh, probably the one that folks know us uh, best for, is the um, uh, our national offer locator tool. So if you go to everyoneon.org, you're able to, uh, to type in a, a zip code and answer a couple of qualifier questions. And uh, what you get is information on uh, low-cost internet service, low-cost computers that are available to you, as well as um, uh, folks that are offering digital skills training in your area. And so um, that is, is a wonderful resource that's available all across the country. Um, in complement to that, that tool is our enrollment assistance hotline um, that provides one-on-one uh, -on -one support for folks who are also interested in, in, in receiving that information. We'll also provide 
um, our Digital Skills Academy that uh, trains individuals across the country and prepares them with digital skills as well as organizations and capacity building too. Um, so there's a wealth of other resources that we provide, but for the sake of time today, we're going to go ahead and skip past this. Um, you can go ahead and visit everyoneon.org uh, to, to get the full breadth of, of our services that we provide. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. Um, the first topic that we will cover today uh, regarding uh, kind of systemic racism in technology is digital redlining. So next slide. Um, so digital redlining, just before we get into kind of the effects and examples of it, we'll go into a definition of what digital redlining is. Digital redlining is discrimination by internet service providers and the deployment, maintenance, or upgrade of infrastructure or delivery of services. Um, the denial of services has disparate impacts on people in certain areas of cities or regions most frequently on the basis of income, race, and ethnicity. So this definition comes to you from the, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, which is a, uh, a, a leading organization that uh, kind of helps to provide information and resources to digital inclusion providers all across the country. Um, and all of the definitions provided there were also informed by those practitioners. Um, so, uh, so, you know, just to give you a sense of, of where we're coming from here. So examples of digital redlining uh, include uh, uh, and, and, and keep in mind, this can take many, many forms. It can occur when internet service providers refuse to offer service to certain neighborhoods or when they offer service at a higher price or with slower speeds. It can also occur when businesses and organizations fail to make their websites and online services accessible to people with disabilities. A recent study by researcher, uh, by the researchers uh, Hernan Galperin, um, Ty Lee, and Kurt Dom found that uh, competition and fiber-based services are less likely in low-income uh, areas and minority communities, with the most severe deficits obser uh, observed in census block groups that combine poverty and a large share of Black residents. Um, and so, you know, disproportionate uh, this this issue disproportionately affects um, um, communities of color and, and folks that are uh, you know at, at, at higher um, risk of of poverty in general and even higher when you combine poverty and uh, communities of color. And so, um, if we can go to the next slide here, what are some what is the history of it? And actually. Uh, the, the term digital redlining is a reference to the practice of redlining, which Dr. Braveman already referred to in her presentation earlier today. Um, but just for the sake of this, this presentation today, it was a form of racial discrimination in the housing market um, that occurred during the 20th century where uh, there were color-coded maps created um, that were designed to indicate where it, was in where it was safe to insure mortgages or lend money to people who lived in certain neighborhoods. Um, and unsafe areas being typically those that were predominantly uh, Black or Hispanic. I don't think it would surprise everyone, anyone to know that many of the communities that were affected by redlining there are affected by digital redlining now. Um, so today, redlining remains alive as a result of several factors that begin with the mere denial um, that this is actually a thing, you know, a lack of transparency and an intention to correct it. And the fact that, you know, today, even today, with all the information that we have, with everything that we know, um, it's it's still simply not illegal. Um, and so this issue is further perpetuated by tech companies' focus on profit, profit over equity. Um, so whether or not it would be profitable to go into certain neighborhoods versus others. Um, and, and government policies that have not adequately re uh, regulated the tech industry. Um, a recent report, as a matter of fact, by the California Community Foundation showed that uh, published pricing for um, internet service shows clear and consistent patterns uh, of the provider reserving its best offers, um, high speed at low cost for the wealthiest neighborhoods in LA County. Um, it, they, it also found that people who live in higher poverty neighborhoods are not only routinely offered slower service at higher prices, but are offered contracts with worse terms and conditions. So, for example, guaranteeing a period of time before prices will increase 
Um, two years in wealthy communities, just one year in high poverty communities. So you can see where this disproportionately affects um, high poverty communities. And then uh, finally, you know, and this is something that, that we in the digital inclusion world have kind of been fighting against for a long time is that um, low cost plans are not consistently advertised to households in high poverty neighborhoods. Um, even today with things uh, such as ACP, that the affordable connectivity program, sorry, um, that which is a, a broadband subsidy offered by the uh, the FCC, um, you know, still you, the information and offers are are not have not quite reached households and are not um, widely offered as far as impact. Um, so this is the, one huge topic, and there's so much that we can cover here. But I just wanted to give you a sense of exactly how this affects households. Um, and obviously, you know, without affordability in the household, without, um, you know, speeds that make it worth the investment, um, it's really, it's prohibitive for folks to be able to have um, high speed internet at home. The next, uh, if we can move on to the next slide, we'll go on to a, a different topic of conversation here, which is artificial intelligence and um, algorithmic uh, uh, discrimination. So AI has been a huge hot topic recently, especially with uh, the introduction of ap applications like ChatGPT, but what is it? How can it be used? What are the pitfalls? So um, artificial intelligence is, is kind of a catch-all term for applications that perform complex tasks that once required human input filtering, decision-making, problem-solving. Um, the backbone to any AI application are algorithms. And algorithms are a set of mathematical instructions or rules that especially if given to a computer will help to calculate an answer to a problem, which sounds amazing. Um, but uh, how can this technology, how can algorithms, how can math be discriminatory? Next slide, please. Well, um, we. Uh, first, in, in uh, defining this, algorithmic discrimination occurs when automated systems contribute to unjustified or different treatment uh, or impacts disfavoring people based on their race, color, ethnicity, sex, uh, religion, age, national origin. So you could see um, all of the populations that are covered here. So basically what we're talking about is how algorithms, in terms of the way they're written and the data they're using to reach their decisions, end up perpetuating racism and contributing to a different treatment of folks based on factors such as race, ethnicity, sexuality, age, um, and so on. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so there is extensive uh, evidence showing that automated systems can produce inequitable outcomes and amplify existing inequality. Um, any data set, for example, that fails to account for existing systemic biases uh, can result in a range of consequences. Um, for example, and, and I think that we covered a bunch of them already, facial recognition technology contributing to wrongful discriminatory um, arrests, um, hiring algorithms, informing discriminatory decisions, healthcare algorithms, uh, discounting the severity of certain diseases in Black Americans, um, and so on and so forth. And really, uh, this this uh, touches and, and exists across many industries, areas, and, and contexts. Next slide, please. And so um, uh, this is just a slide showing a few other, uh, you know, kind of hot topic um, uh, pieces, other issues touching systemic racism and technology. And this is really just to give you an idea of, of you know, exactly how vast this really is. So automated decision making, discriminatory design um, in applications and the design of, of software that goes along with some of the um, technology that we see in our day-to-day -day lives. So just in case this is something that you're interested in, uh, you know, looking into these topics, I encourage it. Next slide. And then here are some strategies to address digital discrimination, um, raising awareness, uh, just having these discussions, increasing diversity in the tech industry, making sure that there um, are voices from, you know, black and brown bodies um, and, and also, you know, from, from uh, women. Recognizing unconscious bias and work uh, to develop unbiased algorithms and data sets, advocating for the creation of regulations and oversight of the tech industry, um, centering voices, like I mentioned, of underrepresented communities, 
um, ensuring all communities have access to high-speed internet and computers as part of the like foundational uh, piece of closing the digital divide and of course providing them the skills to be able to wield that technology. Next slide, please. I know that this was a really, really quick um, overview of all of this, but it's really meant to give you a taste of some of these topics. And I really encourage you to take a look at, at some of these uh, kind of more in depth. Um, but thank you very much for, uh, again, for the, the time and opportunity to present. Thank you, Diana. And thank you everyone for all of your presentations. We only have a couple minutes, but I would like to ask our panelists and Dr. Braveman back to the stage. Uh, we do have some questions that came into the queue. I think we'll only be able to get to one of them. And that question is actually for Dr. Braveman. Um, the question is, um, if you could uh, go into the reasoning for not explicitly naming white supremacy in the definition of racism that you offered. That's a great question. Um, and uh... I'd say that um, that I, I should have, certainly, and that white supremacy is a um, is a very important example of uh, systemic racism <clears throat> uh, in that it's an example of deeply embedded um, uh, concepts uh, and beliefs uh, that affect, uh, people's behavior and that operate on a on a very large scale white supremacy the um ideologic notion because it is basically an ideologic notion of white supremacy um really underscored i mean for for all of the um intentional um discrimination um, white supremacy was there um, in the in the background, uh, uh, you know, giving giving the push. It's um, it it's not so obvious now in certain cases, say with um, racial segregation, um, but the uh, the structures put in place, uh, you know, over a hundred years ago have served to to make it self. Um, perpetuating. So you don't need a white supremacist around to ensure the um, perpetuation of racial segregation. But um, uh, white supremacy is there um, um, explaining, uh, in, in fact, um, uh, I'd say almost all of the, uh, almost all of the structural racism, um, including the Conscious and and not so and not so conscious uh, racism, and I, I think it's important to note that the concept, um, well, white supremacy, of course, is based on a, a notion about races and races being fundamentally different, and that this concept didn't exist before the slave trade, and that the notion of races um, as fundamentally different and um, even biologically different really arose with the Atlantic slave trade um, to justify the enslavement um, of Africans. Uh, so I think white supremacy, um, uh, it's, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that somebody um, brought that, that up, certainly in thinking about structural racism and systemic racism, um, white supremacy is is very, very important. It's just that that's where the conscious, um, that's the, the conscious discrimination uh, is coming from the white supremacy. And I think in a lot of my work, what I've tried to do is shed light on the aspects of the structures that aren't so conscious now, um, but were at one time uh, not so conscious now, and the you know that were the uh, the part of the iceberg that was beneath the surface, the dead, really um, deadly part. White supremacy also is deadly, as we've seen most recently in um, these horrific mass shootings. So thank, thank you for that question. Thank you, Dr. Braveman. And unfortunately, we are at time, and I know that there are many more questions in the queue. So 
Um, I encourage you to reach out to the presenters directly. Um, hopefully you have their information. Thank you everyone for joining. Don't forget to complete the individual session evaluations and then the overall conference evaluation by visiting the conference homepage. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.